Welcome to the Jerry Bovino Show. And now, here's Jerry. Jerry Bovino, we're back with an amazing story. You're going to hear this tale. You're not going to believe it. The bus stop pharmacist, Confessions of a Single Girl, and we want to welcome Adele Tehan to the show. Adele, welcome to Aspen. Thank you, Jerry. It's such a pleasure. I'm feeling so humbled and yeah. excited at the same time to be part of the show. Well, it's the most amazing, serendipitous meeting that Adele and I had. So I'm down in old Snowmass dropping off the car at Midstate Motors. I give a plug to Bill and all the great people at Midstate. And then I'm waiting for the bus to come back. And it's like cold and windy. And this girl walks over, and you can take it from there. How did a girl from Sydney, Australia, wind up in old Snowmass, Colorado, waiting at a bus stop? Go for it. Okay, so I woke up yesterday. I thought, I'm going to do something a bit different today. I've been skiing Snowmass for the past few days. Then I tried Ajax. Then I tried Buttermilk. Then I thought, you know what? I'm going to try to go all the way to the top of Snowmass, which is the Cirque. I went all the way to the top, took some photos, and skid all the way down. Then I thought, you know what, today I'm going to do something different. I'm going to go and explore Aspen Town, or downtown. So I caught the bus from just outside the Stone Bridge Inn where I was staying, dropped me off to Aspen Town just down the road, and I'm thinking, is this Aspen Town? I'm like, no, no, I want to go to the village. I'm expecting something a bit bigger because it's the U.S. <laughs> Coming from Sydney, Australia, you, you want somewhere a bit bigger, more fun. So I'm like asking the bus driver, I'm like, how do you get to Aspen Village? Not realizing there is another place called Aspen Village. She said, okay, it's going to be $2. I'm like, okay, sure. Paid the money, sat on the bus. Here we are. The bus is moving. We got to this place and it's like in the middle of nowhere. There was no shops, there was no building, and I'm like, something is not right here. I think I'm just, I'm a bit lost. There was a lovely guy on the bus. I said, excuse me, uh, where is Aspen downtown? downtown? And he said, it's the place where you caught the bus from. And I'm like, uh, okay, I think I need to go back, right? He said, yes, you do need to go back, but I'll show you where. And then he looked at his timetable on his phone. And then he said, well, um, if you, I'll show you where the bus stop is. And you're lucky because there is a bus coming in six minutes. So I'm like, okay, cool. So let's hop off, hopped off together, crossed the lights. He said, here's a bus stop. And I just walked in and, and here And there you are. we were. So that comes down. Now that's the origin of the yesterday story about how we met. But there was actually a big drama that happened the day you got to Aspen in your condo. And so I, I thought you handled that really well. You, one thing about Adele that you'll find after listening to her for an hour, she's an extremely intelligent, highly articulate, very confident girl. And I think confidence just radiates from you. And the way you handled this drama out in the Stonebridge in Snowmass was pretty impressive. So to give us the capsulized version of what happened in Snowmass when you got here. Jerry, thank you again. Um, okay, so around March, April 2018, I emailed my girlfriend Anna, who's also, it happens to be a pharmacist. I say, Anna, how about going to Aspen with CBD conferencing so we can attend a conference? And at the same time, we're both passionate about skiing. Um, we love skiing, we love the snow, we love the holidays. She said, great idea. Here we are, we booked. By June 2018, we paid for our accommodation. And um, I said, well, we've got a, a unit or a condo, as you would call it. And this, the unit sleeps six people. So I said, well, yeah, that's fine. I, I don't mind having the space. I mean, you know, being on holidays, you want to enjoy yourself. You want to relax. You don't want to be squashed into a little room. Having um, a condo where there's an open fire or just a fire and you've got your own kitchen and you've yeah, got the Yeah, you want to spread out, especially with all your ski crap. Absolutely. Yeah. You just don't want to be squashed in. I said, that's fine. It, and then she said, well, what about if we invite somebody else? I said, look, it's fine as long as I have my own bathroom and my own bedroom. She said, okay. And that was back in June 2018. Fast forward, 30th of December 2018, she sent me a text message. 6.30 a.m. 
I get it. She said, oh, hi, Adele. Uh, we have some friends visiting in Keystone. They may come and visit or stay with us. And if they do, they'll pay you in US dollars. And then I thought about it. I thought, hold on. This is 30th of December. We haven't had a chat about this. We haven't discussed it. It sounds like I've been bombarded with this idea at the last minute of the last hour. It was being crammed down your throat, let's Correct. be honest. Correct. So I reply back and I say, Anna, hi, Anna. Uh, I prefer not to have anyone there. I'm going on a holiday to relax and enjoy myself. The last thing I want is somebody traveling with me that I'm not familiar with their habits. I don't know what they're like. I don't know them. They're total strangers. The last thing you wanted was to wind up on Aspen television. That was the second last thing. <laughs> Absolutely. So how did she respond? Um, she didn't respond to that comment of mine. And I believe she actually deleted my reply. As you know, having an iPhone, it actually tracks down whether the message has been delivered. And sometimes if the person has switched on the red on or red off signal, you could see if the person has read their text message. Again, fast forward, we don't hear, I don't hear from her. There was no phone call. There was no text messages until the 1st of January. We're in Sydney at the International Terminal, Qantas Lounge. We're hopping on a plane coming to LA. And then she says, oh, I've got my friends coming and they're going to stay with us. And I'm like, well, hold on. We haven't had this discussion. I don't know who your friends are. I don't know what I'm going to be experiencing. And having been with you in the past, I know you, do, you tend to do things that aren't very comfortable to me because we view things a little bit differently. Having said that, I'm a very compromising person and I do understand where people come from. So just putting myself so in when you, So did you tell her, forget about it, I'm moving out, or how did you deal with it? Well, we kept on messaging until we hopped on the plane where the time came that she said, oh, he's going to be staying with us or they're going to be staying with us. And I'm like, okay, it might be... A, an, an idea for me to move out and have my own accommodation and then you can have the apartment or the condo with your friends. And then I thought she continues on and on and on and arguing and saying but your brother stayed with us in the past, um, there was no problem, your brother was a, a stranger and I replied back, I said my brother, his name was on the actual booking and he attended the conference. He wasn't a last minute drop in and you knew about it all the way along. So um, I just decided to, to stop the text messaging because she was going on and on and on. I'm like, seriously, what's wrong with this woman? She's not getting it. That's I'm Yeah, you said no. Yeah, no is no. We know that in all forms of human endeavor. Absolutely. So we get to Denver, and I chose not to discuss this matter because I knew it's going to stress me out. I thought, I'll just enjoy Denver, explore the town. We'll go on a hiking tour. So we went up to the Rocky Mountains which was an amazing day. And then the, the same night, we went on a pub crawl. We went to various pubs. We tried the Celtic on market, and then we tried a few others, and we heard about the ghost stories in Denver, and it was just a lovely night to explore the town. So um, fast forward, we get to Stonebridge Inn, where we have to check in, and then I get this guy coming in, grabbing my luggage, and then she says, Anna says to me, do you know Kim? And I'm like, no. And I'm thinking he's just a nice guy trying to help us. Then I go in and I check in. And then she tells the uh, receptionist, can we please have three keys? And I'm like, well, hold on. What do you mean three keys? There's only the two of us. So she gives back one key to the receptionist. And then I'm like, well, hold on a second. Only our names on the reservations, and I've already indicated to you, I feel uncomfortable for a third if person. If it were Brad Pitt, would you have felt differently? Uh, well, all right, don't lie to us. <laughs> no, I would have, I would have not minded if it was Brad Pitt. But there is only the but one. But it wasn't and only. Brad Pitt, right? Okay. Absolutely, there was only one Brad Pitt. There is only one Brad Pitt in the world, and and that wasn't Pitt. him. That's right. That so, was Brad I mean, Schmidt. He's a completely different guy. <laughs> Brad Schmidt. That's it. That's in the new name. So we we take our luggage. We go into the apartment. This person goes in. Brad Schmidt go in. <laughs> I walk in, I said to Brad Schmidt, I'm sorry, you're not welcome here. Please take a luggage and leave. Then the conversation starts going on. Well, hold on, um, there's no accommodation on the whole mountain. I'm like, 
Well, that's not, shouldn't be my problem. Why am I being penalised right. for you being such a short-sighted person and not arranging your accommodation at the last minute? So um, I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to see the management of the Was Stone that in the Stonebridge now? Correct. But you went, you, the new place you got was in the Stonebridge. It was Terry's house, which is okay. ma managed by the Stonebridge yeah, in management. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it falls under the same management. So I went back. And I described my, um, you know, uh, problem with the manager on duty. She was very kind to give me a phone number for the police. So here I am contacting the police. And you called the police. I called the police. And the police were came, and what was their? Police came. Um, they heard my side of the story, and then they said, "Well, it's a civil matter. We're not able to interfere. What we're going to do is facilitate." the um, mutual, um, you know, resol resolution of this problem. We're but at the point where you were going to call the police, it seems like your friend who you booked the trip with would have said to the guy, look, it's not working out. Find a place to stay. She doesn't want you here. It's like no is no. Yeah, she was very, But she very, didn't. She didn't. She was insistent that he, she, he could stay and, like, crawl in your bed at night or whatever he wanted to do. One of her text messages to me, she said to me, I'm giving you the courtesy to tell you they're going to be someone yeah. staying with us. All right. Anyway, you got a new hotel room, so that's at least it worked out okay where yes. you didn't have this guy who you didn't oh, know. Yeah, but yeah. it's like yeah, from nothing, you wind up with the police, and uh, it's like what a way to start a vacation. Oh, it was so, so far, how's Aspen been for you? Has it been good? Do you like it? Aspen is just beyond spectacular. <laughs> Thank you. We feel that way. That's why we live here. <laughs> so course. here's what we're going to do. I'm going to tell you and give you a little prequel to the show, what it's going to be like. First of all, uh, this is an amazing person. Not only is she a black belt in Taekwondo, she's passionate about animals, about preserving the planet, and she knows a lot about dating. She's been engaged twice, and she has made a list for me over the years of all the problems that a successful woman, and that will be the thrust of our show, the problems that a successful woman has to deal with in the dating world and how the world has changed. And believe me that Adele is not the only successful woman who has been in this position. And she's made a list of the qualities in men that we're gonna go through in a minute. Immature, insecure, stingy, damaged, addict, womanizer, and the best one is or simply clueless. You don't want to miss this show. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a short break to recognize the underwriters who very generously support us here at Grassroots Television. We always want to thank Bishop Plumbing, Heating, and Air Conditioning. Andrew Sandler at Bootsy's, Bootsy Bellows has been a good supporter. And we have a new supporter now, uh, Kasowitz Benson and Torres, and a nationally prominent law firm, uh, Mark Kasowitz is one of the most famous lawyers in the world, and he has partnered with my son David Bovino and Ron Rossi and Maria Gorecki to open an Aspen office that will bring the incredible bandwidth of a national law firm to Aspen. Uh, you definitely want to be watching for them if you have a problem because they'll be able to help you out. We take a short break. We're going to come back and hear about the black belt pharmacist, animal lover, who can tell you about men. We're coming right back. Bishop Plumbing and Air Conditioning, serving Aspen and Vail for over 40 years. Shoe covers, name tags, IDs. Let Bishop worry about your heating, plumbing, and air conditioning issues so that you don't have to. Bishop Plumbing and Air Conditioning, Jerry Bovino, we're back with the Bus Stop Pharmacist, Confessions of a Successful Girl, Adele Tehan from Sydney, Australia. And Adele, you have an interesting family background. 
Your family's originally from Lebanon. You're okay. Christian, but you're able to trace your last name and your your uh, roots back to probably Jewish ancestry in Spain. Mm -hmm. So you like the typical, like, tell us that story. Uh, it, it's an amazing thing. And your father was a chess champion. He was, yes. Yeah, yes, and so tell us yes. how... I, I'm curious, someone who has so much confidence like you and is so smart, I always want to genuinely attribute it to their f family, their upbringing, their parents. I know my mother gave me confidence. Tell us about how your parents gave you confidence. Um, you know, one of those things, Jerry, um, confidence comes from your childhood, I think. It comes from also doing things, failing and then succeeding, failing and succeeding. But failing is a big part of confidence. And one of the mistakes that most parents make, and I've made it myself over the years, is you want to keep your children from failing. But we don't learn anything from succeeding. You learn Correct. from your failures. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, but also I was reading some books and it, it turns out that the biggest um, factor that will help you to end up being confident is from your parenthood, from your parents, mum and dad, and the way they've raised you and how much they've loved you. So as a child, I grew up in an extremely loving home. My mum and dad, they worked so hard, both of them together united, to make sure us children, because I'm a one of four, so I'm the eldest, and I have three younger... And what are you, you, you have three brothers? I have three younger brothers. Tell, say, say hello to them by name now. Hello, I want to say hello to Aziz, Chad, and Roger. So. Perfect. And so you feel like your, your parents had a... And they were both immigrants, right? Correct. And yes. they came from Lebanon I, in the 1960s to Australia. My mother came in the 60s um, on, on a boat, um, like most people would come originally to any country, a new country. And yeah, she lived there for around 10 years where she worked and she bought her own property and she built her own name. And, and then um, afterwards she went for a holiday and then she met mom, my, my dad and uh, she got married. We were born there. And then she decided to come back to Australia, where we went to schools and universities. Has so Australia always been welcoming to immigrants? Uh, and what's the current... In America now, we're having a big debate about immigration. Um, Americans know that we need legal immigration. There's no debate about that. Correct. We're a country of immigrants. Absolutely. And if you weren't like a Native American Cherokee or something, <laughs> you're an immigrant. That's right. And so we love immigrants. And... Uh, one thing I believe about America, I think we're the best country in the world at amalgamating our immigrant population into becoming Americans within one generation. But we're having Amazing. a big debate now mm -hmm. about illegal immigration. And so what's the Australian perspective on immigration now? Uh, it's the same. And I'm very much pro-immigration because any person who doesn't have a, a dark, dark skin is an ethnic person in Australia um, or in America. I mean, we all came on the boat at one stage and we uh, inhabited this country and we've worked hard and we paid our taxes and we became decent, abiding citizens. And we can't grow. We need this immigration. We can't grow without immigration. Everybody so, recognizes that. Yes. But it's amazing. One of the differences from like when my grandparents came or when... When your parents left Lebanon, they wanted to become Australian. Absolutely. They wanted to be Australian. That's right. And my, when my grandparents came, they didn't want to be European. They wanted, they were very proud to be American. Absolutely. Now we have different ethnic groups that are coming here, and they want to retain their culture from the country they left, which, after a while, becomes confusing to those of us who think Americans are white, black, red, uh, yellow. Yes. Uh, Every mix, we're all Americans, but we want to be Americans. Yes, yes, for sure. Look, um, um, the, my mother wanted to go back to Australia. She loved Australia so much, and her love and passion has transcended into us children. So when we went there, it, we loved it. We, we, we've never had any other passport except an Australian passport. So we are Australian first and foremost. And, and speaking of which, her parents are Americans. Her mother was born in New Jersey. Her father migrated to um, the U.S. in 1910. So this is 109 years ago. So it just shows you. And, and she had the option to come to the U.S., but she chose Australia. No offense, we love the U.S., but it's just where your heart is. Now, you're a pharmacist now, 
But you're more than just a pharmacist because you're also a businesswoman and Correct. you're a very successful businesswoman. You can come skiing in Aspen. That's not chopped liver. And uh, you had several pharmacies at one point. Correct. And what, what do you think incentivized you to go from being a, an employed pharmacist to owning your own pharmacies? What, what sparked you to do that? Okay, so I was seven years old. I was sitting between mom and dad. We were discussing what I'm going to do when I grow, finish school. And there were a few options on the table. There was either dentistry, medicine, or pharmacy. So I knew because I loved people and I loved science, I wanted in, to be in healthcare. And being in healthcare, there's a few options you could be and, you know, study and then eventually find a job and work and be in it. Now, I didn't want to spend my whole day looking into people's mouth. It's pretty depressing. Yeah. Again, no offense to it, all the dentists it would be, out And there. actually, dentists have uh, have a very high incidence of suicide. Because <laughs> they're like in their little one millimeter I and know. it's like, you want to tear your hair out. I know, I know, I know. So it was just, okay, so no dentistry. Medicine, 10 to 15 years of study. It's not to the faint hearted. It's something that you've got to work hard for a long, long time. And it's like, by the time I'll be a, a doctor, I'll be like 35 or maybe in my 30s. Okay, how about pharmacy? I'm like, this is me, seven years old. I'm gonna have my own pharmacy when I... There you go. So that's where it started. And it's just like, was my goal and finished school. But did school. you have the preparation from your family or from your schooling to do the business side of a pharmacy? Because there's big dollars moving through there. Correct, correct. My father was self-employed. His father was self-employed. So he was able to give you some guidance about how to run a business and track the cash and do all the stuff? It was a limited, limited uh, guidance because he was in a different type of business. Being in pharmacy is a whole different ball game. It'll take um, to, to learn, study, train, get mentoring, get help. It's just not that easy to, to do it, but it's not impossible. I think well, if you really want to do it, you'll do it. I joked with Adele yesterday that I just, I'm a physician, that the reason you can't read a physician's handwriting is that it's a secret code to the pharmacist which says, I got my money, now you get yours. <laughs> I love it. It's, it's, it sounds terrible because we're meant to be in health care, so it's health and then you care. But, yeah, it just... It's, but it's you a can't... Um, nowadays, everything's going digital, right? I Correct. mean, you, yes. like handwritten prescriptions are... Yes anachronistic but tell us a little bit about pharmacy as a profession because it's evolved dramatically in the last five decades when I went to medical school pharmacists basically did labeling and packaging mm -hmm. that was the scope of what they did mm -hmm. now tell us what's happening with professional pharmacists today okay so today there is more medication they're more complex people are getting older we're dealing with aging population so there is a big big potential for pharmacists to get into medication management and that's where I believe the future is. You know getting a product is easy so there is two parts to it supply model or the medication management model and that's where most pharmacists want to be because we are still healthcare professionals. Especially with drug interactions and I know that as a prescribing physician, I wasn't aware of the potential drug interactions mm -hmm. as the pharmacist would be. Sometimes they'd call me up and say, you prescribed with, with that. I say, oh, yeah, all right, well, thanks for calling. Yes, <laughs> yes, that's right. And you right. see it, right? It happens. That's right. It's yeah. not just drug interactions. It's also drug-disease interaction. Uh, there's also disease-disease interaction. There's so much to look into. Also, the b other biggest problem that we have in pharmacy is compliance. 50% of, of people don't take their medicines. Or they don't take it correctly and they self-medicate and that creates problems. So very often I'll be talking to patients or customers in my pharmacy and I'm like, okay, take one tablet three times a day and they go, oh, no, no, I'm not going to take it this morning because it's blah, blah, blah. I'm like, no, no, if you don't take it, it doesn't work. Please don't self-medicate. Speak to me. I will guide you. I'm your pharmacist. Come back to me and I will give you the guidance and the help that you need. And the other thing that's interesting is when I went to medical school, everything was in Latin. You take one PO, which is like per orum oh. by mouth. Yes. TID, which is three, three times a day. Now we've gone to like 
take one pill by mouth three times a day. day. Otherwise, they're using it as a suppository. It's like that's right, that's right. We we still use Latin, so doctors in Australia still. But they're trying Latin. to evolve away from it now. There's a trend in America okay. to talk in plain English. Yes. Which isn't. I always joke with the medical students. You know, if you sometimes you need to have a fancier name, like if you have an upper respiratory infection. Mm -hmm. That's probably a $50 visit. But you right. have a cold that's worth five bucks. You know, you got to give it a little cachet. Yes, yes. So, uh, okay. So now you're a professional pharmacist. You own pharmacies. You've correct. got all that responsibility. You're mm -hmm. a very successful woman. You're passionate about the earth. And you. one of the things that struck me is you said you love interacting with people and being nice to people and making a better day. And talk a little bit about that concept, because if everybody in the world had it, the world would be a better place. Well, I hope so, and I hope more people, my, my philosophy becomes more contagious to other people as well. Um, what I do in my job, I always try to make sure I do my job 100%, but I put the empathy, the passion, and the care into it. So. You can, anybody can do a job. You can get a robot and they can deliver the same service, but no one's going to go and try to listen to you with an empathic heart and be passionate about it and really care about you. It's like, it's not just telling you how to take your medication, but also giving you a bit extra to help you with it and then being there for you if you need any help and guidance to come back to us for guidance and help. Yeah, it's interesting because I, I totally subscribe to that. And whenever I go along and see someone doing what I consider to be like an undesirable menial job, an example would be the person who cleans the restrooms at the airport. I mean, I can't think of a worse job than being there, having thousands of people come through, and you're the guy who has to, or the woman, who has to clean the floors and wipe up the urine or whatever they're doing. So I always go over to that person. I do it every time I go in the restroom if there's a, an attendant there. And I say, you know, thank you. It looks really nice. It's really clean. We appreciate that. I guarantee you nobody has ever spoken to the, those people. And in, in the Denver airport, we have a lot of Ethiopians working. So I learned how to say thank you in Ethiopian, Amazing. which is Amasekanala. I love see? it. So you go up to this guy, and no one's spoken to this guy in the last 12 yes. years. And I give him my little Amasekanala, and suddenly you see a smile come up. And if everybody did that, the world would be better. It's all these little things. It's kindness, care. It's just uh, um, one of the biggest bestsellers of the 21st century or 20th century as it should say is how to win friends and influence people and I'm sure you would have read it. Yes, it's a famous book uh, written I think in the 20s or 30s. I'm trying to remember. Correct. It was in the, around the 1920s. Yeah, written by an American. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Dale Carnegie. Dale Carnegie, exactly. Carnegie. So um, he said in his book what people want more than any money, any fame is to be appreciated and acknowledged. Yeah. So if we just give them that, we're just going to give them so much more than paying them more. You just make them feel valued and appreciated. It's just so worth it. So here's an interesting, as I was preparing for the show, I have a friend. I'm going to tell you about her. Yep. She, uh, her name's Fern Malice. She was a friend in college, and she was beautiful and had a willowy figure just the, and became very famous in fashion over the years. And, but she never married. She had lovers, boyfriends, you know, Italians, whatever, all along the way, Europeans. Mm -hmm. she a phenomenally successful woman. Yep. Okay, yes. extremely well, mm -hmm. well respected. And one time recently I was out to lunch with her because she's like one of my closest friends. And she, she joked with me. I said, Fern, why didn't you ever like get in a... She said, you know what? I became the man I always wanted to marry. <laughs> and I love that thought because she's so successful, so accomplished, mm -hmm. so smart, so beautiful. But she became, and in a way, as I was reading through your history and talking about you know, the fact that you've been engaged several times, but you're a black belt in Taekwondo, <laughs> you run a company, you make money. You go, did, you, did you become the man you always wanted to marry, Adele? No. No. I still believe What would be different about that guy from you? Or, or would he be a male um, version of you? Really, I'm not looking for someone who's the same as me. It will be a little bit boring to to meet someone who's exactly. Yeah, if you the want same. someone the same, the best expression I heard about that is, if 
if I wanted, I, it would be hard to get someone the same as me because my shadow could do it better. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Um, no, I still believe that there's someone out there that I um, could be with and marry and potentially. Do you want to be in, at this stage, you know, the girls in Aspen joke, joke the successful ones, don't, mm -hmm. they don't want to be a nurse or a purse, mm -hmm. okay? So yes. they don't want to marry a 98-year-old guy and yes. they don't want to be support. Yes. And it's an interesting phenomenon. They don't want to be supporting a man, okay? Now, here's something... Then but, I but hold on a second. It's, there's nothing wrong supporting your partner because he will support you back. But here's the difference between men and women that I see in my own life. If a guy, okay, a successful guy in Aspen who's 60 years old mm -hmm. and he's done well in business or in professionally, and if he breaks up with his girlfriend or loses his wife, he can be perfectly happy going out with a... And let's assume he's highly educated, mm -hmm. okay? He could be perfectly happy going out with a beautiful girl that he met that may be working as an, a flight attendant or a, a, a bartender. Mm -hmm. or, and, not, and nothing wrong with that. I mean, he could Absolutely. be perfectly happy with that. Yes. But the reverse is more difficult for women. As a highly educated woman with three degrees, okay, if you met, like, a great guy here who was, and there's nothing wrong with it, I'm just saying the discrepancy between the educational and professional levels, most women don't want to date down or marry down. Mm -hmm. and I don't know how to say that. I, mm. I, th I think it's an accurate statement that may come across sounding, it's like something's wrong with it, but comment on that. Uh, look, I think you're right. A little bit, you've, you've kind of hit a kind of a, a spot there. But I, I just think if you meet somebody, even if they're not at the same intellectual, educational, financial level, but if they treat you right, for me, I can speak of myself. I can't speak of every other single lady out there in Aspen or anywhere else in the world. Um, I think if, that, if I meet somebody and they don't have the same educational level, and I have dated guys who don't have the same ed educational level or the same But profession. they could still be highly intelligent. Absolutely. Education and intelligence aren't the same. You could be very intelligent but not educated. You can be very educated and not intelligent. Well, most of the people in the world fit in the <laughs> second category, believe me. You always wonder how they got through, like, second grade. I don't oh, know. Oh, yeah, you went to Harvard? Are you kidding me? <laughs> Uh, given Harvard a bad name when this happens, <laughs> <laughs> which is not really fair. But, yeah, it just um, – I, I have dated guys. Actually, as a matter of fact, last night I had one of my ex-boyfriends who we were nearly getting engaged, and he messaged me, and he's wishing me a happy new year and saying, I love your photos in Aspen, and uh, how is the snow, how is the skiing? And I'm like – it's just beyond spectacular. You should come here. So start off with, you were engaged when you were very young. Mm -hmm. And that we'll call him bachelor number one. Correct. Okay, and what happened with bachelor number one? Because yeah. at that time when we were young, were you 20, 21, 22? I was uh, 27. Okay, 27, 27, still young. Yes. And yes. so what happened with him? Why did that fizzle? You, found, you learned something about him. Absolutely. And, and that's a common thread yes. when I talk to the women who come on the show. Yes. These guys look like they're great in the beginning. Yes. Okay. They start out, man, they are hitting home runs. They're doing everything right. Correct. And then Correct. it's like over time, they get the dwindles. Yes. So explain what happened. Okay. So met at a charity fundraising dinner. Lovely guy, um, and, and then he, it took him around three weeks to meet me and speak to me again because at this function, I didn't know him, but I knew a friend of his. So he approached this friend. He said, oh, can, I, can you, you know, facilitate me talking to this lady? Three weeks later, we start chatting. We catch up at another dinner, and then we start dating. He was a great guy, lovely guy. I can't say anything bad about him. Up to pretty much, and that was around the same time when I basically bought my first pharmacy. So at the time where basically I borrowed so much money and I wanted to pay it back quickly, but it wasn't on the expense of the relationship. And three months later, we got engaged. And then um, started looking for a place to... Were you more financially successful than him? No. Okay, all right. No. no Would he... that bother you, though? It, it, 
let's just assume that you're financially successful now. I know you are. Would it bother you if a guy didn't have anything, but he otherwise was like... Uh, it wouldn't bother me. Like, I, again, if, if he treats me right and we have this interaction, the, uh, relationship based on respect and trust, I think it'll work. That's a good answer. But a lot of the girls come on the show when I prod them a little bit. They say they really don't want to be, like, supporting a guy. It, it's, and they're not embarrassed to say that. They just don't want to do it. But, I mean, they can go and get a job. They don't have to get a job earning them millions of dollars, but they can go and drive an okay. Uber. Okay, all right. There's nothing wrong with earning a decent living. I totally agree. All right, so then he, he, you go ahead. You So, um, yeah, it just was his, his – um, he started changing, and, and, and things started coming up from nowhere where, you know, we were looking for a place to live. We found the place. We made an offer. It was accepted. I'm like, come on, let's buy the place because – oh, I, I'm, I don't want to do all this extra work with this new place. And I'm like, well, didn't you think that three months ago? You just wasted all these weekends looking for a place. And I'm like, th at this stage, I started thinking, and I'm a quite a deep person. I'm like, if this, is guy, if this is the guy who's changing his opinion about the place we're going to live, what's going to happen when we have children and then we need to send them to a certain school and then he's just going to change his mind? And I just, I didn't have the confidence in him. I'm like, where is it all coming from? Two weeks later, he says, oh, my father said, let's go and live in Strathfield. Strathfield is a suburb in Sydney. And I'm like, well, are you marrying your father or you're marrying me? <laughs> Should we, you be speaking to your father or you're going to speak to me? What did your parents think of him? Did they like um, him? I actually, something happened, um, and my father said to me, I think if he's doing this right now, forget about he him. Had a, your father had a good premonition that this wasn't going to be helpful. When your father says something... Yeah. And my More father, times than not, a lot of kids don't realize how much wisdom their parents have until they're much older and they look back. Yes. Because we think we know everything when we We don't. Young. We don't. And, and father, uh, my father was a very um, well-spoken person. He didn't speak too much, but when he said something, it was, you know, worthwhile. And when your father says to you, and I'm the only daughter, so he's not going to say things. And, and he's an extremely loving, caring person when he was around, and I, I still believe he is where he is. Um, and when he says that, you go, well, I need to step back and think about it. So a month later, we broke up, and then he asked me for his ring. For his ring back. For his ring back. And to me, it was, if you have an argument with someone, you still have the ring, that's fine. You talk in two days' time, that's fine. Yeah. You just, you know, make up, you know, you send flowers, and you have that, that's fine. Five days later, he calls me. So when he asked for his ring back, I gave him his ring. Which um, is the right thing to do, I think. That's right. If he asked, I gave it to him. He gave me, I bought him a watch. He gave me the watch back, asked for his ring. I gave him the ring. And I thought, okay, we're done. Five days later, he calls me at work. Hi, Adele. Hey, blah, blah, blah. A few words. And then, oh, would you want to get back together? And I'm like, no. You <laughs> um, said that. I you said, had no. made up your mind. You weren't going to. Normally, you know, it's a funny thing. Where people break up and then they think, oh, a little time later, we'll get back together. But there was a reason that you broke up in the first place. Correct. So 99 out of 100 times, you can't get back. Correct. It, it's going to be the same problem there just two yes. weeks later. Yes, that's right. And I thought, well, I just didn't feel I've been, I was loved by that person. And, and then since then, now you were engaged a second time. Correct. Who will call bachelor number two. Two. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, and tell us about bachelor number so, two. Bachelor number two, we met at work. Um, he practiced. He was a psychiatrist, and he had. They're his... all crazy, by the way. Even <laughs> That's what I, I love all the psychiatrists in the valley here, but most of them, as their wives probably know, their seat back is not in the fully upright and locked position. <laughs> well, yes, I had to learn this the hard way. Um, initially, I was a bit kind of hesitant to date him, go out with him. And, um, and because then, he was a psychiatrist, or no, something no, no, about not him? at all. He, he. When I first met him, he was living with this other woman. They weren't married, so they were a de facto. And to me, is if you're with somebody, I'm not interested. I'm not going there. So if somebody is married or engaged or going out or whatever, I just don't. I'm just not interested. Going. There's plenty of other guys out there that potentially you could, you know, meet and. Plenty have a of fish in the sea is even a website. That's right. So, um, yeah, initially, um, then he broke up with that person, moved out. Eight months later, he started chasing me. He wanted to go out with me, and I'm like, I don't know what you want. Like, I think we're on a different. And and to me, if someone lived with some, if if a guy lives with a woman for a long time, and they don't get married, it's just there's something not right there. 
it, it just it doesn't feel right, right? After eight years. So um, we, we started dating and then um, he proposed around five months later. But he was extremely generous. He kept on buying me presents. And there were Should a man do that? Do you think that's necessary? Well, if, if, I don't think it's necessary. It's nice to make the woman feel appreciated and uh, show her that you're generous and you care and, you know, buying things. But it's not the, I'm not the type of person who needs that. And I said it to him... It wasn't a requirement. Absolutely not. I mean, there's other things they can do. It could be smaller, more thoughtful, more caring. Just to show they care is yeah, really what yeah, you Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, the little things that really matters, the little thoughts really, really matters. So, um, you know, he's buying me things like, you know, Gucci dresses, handbags, shoes, artwork. Expensive gifts. Expensive gifts. And I knew he had debts, which I didn't know how. I'm like, okay, being a little bit younger, you don't really know everything. And I still don't know everything. I don't claim. It's a matter of thinking and observing and thinking and observing. It's not in a, in a way that becomes a really OCD kind of type. But, um, yeah, I said to him once, I said, well, John, his name is John. I said, John, I don't want you to buy me anything. If we're going to get married and have a family, we're going to have to, you know, spend money on the children. And then he looked like with a shock in his, with a shock on his face. And I'm like, I must have prompted something. Maybe he thought I'm going to be the one who's supporting him and supporting the mm -hmm. children. It must have been a wake-up call. And that made him more depressed because he was quite depressed and he was taking Prozac, four capsules a day. Um, and it, it was really, obviously, it wasn't working. He was still depressed. <laughs> but here's an interesting observation. I read there was a woman who wrote a book years ago, probably 30, 40 years ago, and her premise was that one of the ways that women can make themselves attractive to men is to show them that they need the man for something. And her exact verbiage is, women can make themselves attractive when they make the man feel masculine. Because like dating back to caveman days, okay, the men were like going out and killing the bison and cooking yeah. them or whatever they were doing. They were and the women and were taking care yes. of the babies. Yes. And there was a masculinity factor yes. that the women needed men. Yeah. But you made a very... Oh, so just let me stop that thought for a second. You basically don't need a man, and not just you. Yes. I'm talking about the modern, educated, successful, intelligent woman yes. no longer needs a man. That's right. Okay? That's you right. can do perfectly well on your own. Yes. And But have we lost something in that magnetic attraction between the sexes when it's clear to the guy that you don't need him for squat? You may want That's to be right. with him, yes. but it's not a need anymore. Correct, correct. So our societies have changed. Um, women and men don't actually need each other from a financial or survival point of view. And you alluded to that in our preparation for the show. Yes. And I liked the way you said it. I thought it was brilliant. You said, we no longer need each other for our basic needs, correct. which are readily available. Talk about yes, that. Yes, so we, we read it, and, and at times we, we don't need to go and plant in the fields, and we don't need to go and hunt and gather to survive. What we seek these days, in my opinion, is the fulfillment, the emotional companionship, spiritual. We get that from the, having the right person next to us. We, we get that sometimes from our friends, from our families. But I think if we're seeking a partner to share life with, this is the biggest thing that people are missing out. And I think we're, we're at this stage in our lives because societies have evolved. Uh, women have evolved. Our roles changed. Men's roles changed. It's confusing to the men as well. I, I, we could spend two days of shows on this subject. Yes. That all of our traditional role models have been so turned upside down. Sure. In America, we can't even figure out which bathroom to use. Okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm, if I'm it is a line on the up. ladies' bathroom, I go to the men's. <laughs> <laughs> we have transgender bathrooms. We have every kind of There's bathroom. There's nothing wrong with that. That's so right. So everybody's role has been, which had been divine, defined for millennia, Mm -hmm. And suddenly we're all unsure whether, whether the men should be more caring 
and soft-spoken and address our feminine side mm. and whether women should be more outspoken. And much of society isn't prepared for that. You know, if a man in the boardroom is dynamic and he will say, he's a man, he's got balls. Yes. If it's a woman, what do they say? She's a bitch. That's right. right. Unfortunately, so, it's So it's, it's, it's like we, we haven't really grown up yet. to the changes in society yet. We haven't. It's, it's, we're slowly morphing into that. I mean, it's just exactly what you said. If a woman is, you know, loud and she knows what she wants, she's bossy. Bossy, that's a perfect bossy. word. And if it's a guy doing it, oh, yeah, he's, he's a male, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, it's again, he's a macho. Macho, that's it. That's exactly right. And it's, 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 I think it's up to men and women to change that perception. You said something else yesterday that really impressed me. When we were talking about the difference between men and women. Yep. And I said, like, men are stupid. They have, like, very basic needs, hungry and horny, you know. Yeah. And, and you said women aren't that complicated either. That's right. And what you said was, and I thought this was, I've never heard it framed this way, but I thought it was brilliant. You said women want to be loved unconditionally. Absolutely. And if they get that, you, yeah. they'll take a lot of other crap. Yeah. Now, if you're in a relationship and the man is having an affair, does this mean he's loving his wife unconditionally? You tell me. No. I mean, he's not loving her because he's loving somebody else. So at the end of the day, I believe that women want to be loved and men. We both want the same thing, but we just we talk about it differently. We, we see it differently. But at the end of the day, our basic need to be loved, it's unconditional love. So are you dating now? You have any no, interest in No, I'm not dating right now. I potentially I could be dating when I go back home. Uh, have you tried online dating? I have tried online Which dating. Which sites have you used? I've used uh, Bumble. Bumble is a good one. Yes. Explain to the viewers who don't know how the Bumble model works. Okay, so it's it's a similar framework to um, Tinder. So it, you select the person based on their looks, but now it's it's actually evolving because you can choose, um, you can read a little bit about them, but it, it you just know of the person, you don't know the person. And you can go yes or no, you select the person, and then it's up to the lady to initiate the conversation. Is that a good thing? Tell me that. I think yes and no. I think it's good. I feel comfortable with it um, because I'm a busy person, so I'm not on this platform the whole time and I'm constantly using it. But um, I had a friend of mine, uh, my, my housemate, she said, oh, there's a new app you should try. It's called Bumble. And I'm like, okay, Bumble. And I like, went and Googled it. I'm like, okay, it's an app. You just download it from the app store and you just create, and it link into your Facebook profile. So it kind of got a bit of solid information in there. It depends if you've inputted your information originally into Facebook. Correctly. Um, <laughs> correctly. Yeah. If age 24. Age, yes, that's right. If I mean, you know, you look at some people, you go, oh, you don't look 50, you look like 80. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, it, you just get to learn that. And I'm like, why have you got your whole face covered, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, it, it's quite interesting. I've met few people um, through that app when I had the chance to interact with them and organize a coffee date. But nothing really eventuated. But the other thing is, Bumble, once again, is one of these newer age things. Historically, from when like I was a kid, the man asked a girl out. It was very unusual for a girl, unheard of, mm -hmm. for a girl to go up and ask a guy out. And, yep. and by having to ask a girl out, it gave you sort of first mover status, mm -hmm. but it also put you at risk of rejection. And rejection, none of us want to be rejected. Correct. The good thing about Bumble from the male perspective mm -hmm. is if the woman initiates, it takes away that potential rejection. Correct. Make the guy feel a bit more comfortable with the interaction. Now, it comes, this, this ha, whole, the whole concept of a man asking a woman out, because biologically speaking, the male is the aggressor in nature. That's, this is why women are the more gentle, softer. Biologically speaking, that's 100% true. Yeah. So if you look at the animal kingdom, the one that look the best are the males. The lion. Right, the of course. The peacock. Right. The big, yeah, so it's all, they're all the males that look the best. The females don't look as attractive because they know the male's going to, you know, to ensure the survival of the species they've got to follow the female to ensure that so and that's where and, and at the end of the day us human homo sapiens we're still <laughs> animals with a big brain we are with a massive gray matter we think too much we're a little bit complex but we all want the same thing at the end of the day so 
Okay, now we're going to go through your list of the things in men that you found <laughs> you just can't get the right balance of. <laughs> so let's start with um, immature. Mm -hmm. What percentage of the guy? Like in Aspen, it would be 100% immature because <laughs> we're all Peter Pans here. We came here because we don't want to grow up, see? Mm -hmm. So, but what percentage of the men that you meet are actually mature? I would say around 20%. Okay, that's not too bad. That's not too bad. All right. Yes, yes. And... Uh, Insecure. I think yes. we all have insecurities, Adele. It's, it's about getting this balance right. It's hitting the sweet spot, you know. It, no one's perfect. I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. No one's perfect. But, you know, getting in between to be into this balance, having a bit of insecurity is not a bad thing because it allows us to try to move out of insecure zone. In the same way, in maturity, we all want to be kids at the end of the day. We all have a child within, within us, don't we, we? We do. Actually, I once heard that a guy really just wants to find a girl who's going to get the little boy inside to come out and play. And same with, with the girls. It's the same with the yeah, girls. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with it. Now, yeah. stingy. That's an interesting. Some yes. of these guys are like tighter than yes. the rusted lug nuts on a 54 Chevy, right? Yes. I mean, yes. they won't spend a dime. Well, that's also is a problem. Like, you know, if you're not going to spend money on your partner, where are you going to spend money but on? But they don't have to be profligate spenders throwing money around. Absolutely But don't not. keep every nickel in your pocket. I mean, oh, that's a fair... Just show that you actually care. I mean, I'm not looking for someone like my ex-bachelor number two, yeah. who is buying me thousands of dollars worth of gifts and presents, but somebody who will just, even a little small insignificant things for my birthday or Christmas. Uh, something. Yeah, that's right. Damaged. We're all damaged. But yeah. <laughs> no, no, what, there's what? people who are really, really damaged. damaged. Yeah, yeah. From their parents or who did that? Uh, no, it would be either, well, yes, I think everything goes down to your childhood again, um, growing up. It's caused so much damage in your personality and you tried to sweep it under the carpet and not really try to tackle it head on and deal with it. Addiction, a very common problem in Aspen, mm -hmm. alcohol and yes, drugs. Have yes. you experienced that in dating? Um, not to that extent. Being a pharmacist, I could actually detect it and I'm somebody who tried to help and treat people with various types of addiction. But addiction is actually very high in pharmacists mm -hmm. because they have access to you know, prescription drugs. If they get caught. <laughs> Unless until they get caught. <laughs> yes. Womanizer. Talk yes. about that one. Yes. Uh, You've had that. I've had that. It's a was person. that was infidelity important to you? Was it's that very, important? Yes, because at the end of the day, I don't want to get STDs from that person. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to, you know, end up with some sort of a disease. So it's important to me if I'm dating someone to know that this person isn't going sleeping around with other women. So. And as a pharmacist and a physician, we're like overly cognizant of what's out there. Absolutely. I mean. The stuff that's going on. Even in America, we're having an epidemic of syphilis. Oh. I mean, I haven't seen syphilis in like 40 years. I mean, it's back. Yes. Yeah, it's not just in America. It's everywhere. Heterosexual males are getting more um, STDs. HIV is on the rise. Um, and it's, this is within the, the, you know, heterosexual males. Yeah, but even the things you don't think about, chlamydia, HPV, herpes. I mean, it's, Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, who wants to go and get a... STD, really. No. <laughs> no. Last thing on my mind. <laughs> no, nobody that I know. But the best one is simply clueless. Yes. That's, yes. Some of the guys are just like inept. Uh, just like, you know, where have you been? You know, 45 years old, they don't know what they want in life. They still, I'm not, I haven't thought about it. And I'm like, if you haven't thought about it at 45, when are you going to do it? When you're yeah, like 85? Exactly. It's never going to work. <laughs> well, you've been an amazing guest, Adele. Adele is a professional pharmacist. She owns pharmacies. She's a black belt in Taekwondo. She, uh, she has her, her act together. I would say that for sure. Highly intelligent. I, and you're just a, like a wonderful girl. And I just hope that you can find, if you could find a man that was half as good as you, you'd probably be happy with him oh, because they, there, there's just not that much great guys out there. There are great guys. Oh, don't say that. I hope there is. There, well, <laughs> most of these guys are, as I told you, Frank Lloyd wrong. But um, you're, you're, it was really fun to have you here in Aspen. I hope you come Thank back you. next year with your family. Thank you, hopefully. If any of you guys out there fall in love with Adele, email me at AspenRacer at AOL <laughs> and I'll send her your picture. And we will see you next week.